Yeah. Fucking technology, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to add something? Uh, no, thank you. You've got the microphone. <laughs> All right. Anyhow, recently there was this book published called The Hacker's Manifesto. Anybody's read it? Anybody's in the room read it? Hacker's Manifesto? Raise your arms. What do you think of it? Useful, not useful, bullshit, worthwhile information? Basically, the main thesis in the book is that our world, our economy, is no longer dominated by what we would call capitalists. Capitalists have been for a long time a dwindling figure in the economy. They are disappearing slowly, but they are disappearing. So what this dominant class is slowly, yet gradually, replaced by is hackers. Hackers who have access to those vectors through which information flows. Okay, that sounds like bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Please expand on it. Tell us why. Well, I don't know really. I don't just don't think um, hackers are replacing capitalists and are disseminating information. And, uh, I don't think this is where we are going. Um, I, I, where is the capitalist I'm replacing? I would like to meet him. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's not that hard to find. I'm having this friend. We go back a long time. We were together at the university. He graduated in computer science, and while being a student, he would go like, ah, open source rules, free software, free software, you know, having t-shirts. Uh, he was what you call a hacker, somebody who programs a lot, who likes technology, who lives with technology. Anyway, years went by. He graduated. He says, what do I do, mom, now? Mom says, get a job. <laughs> so he got a job at the University of Crete. The wage there is not that big, it's not that large, it's not that much money. So he says to his mom, mom, what do I do now? I want more money. I want to buy myself a nice car. So his mom goes, ah, oh, well, you should sell something, offer people a service. That's the way to make money. So what he does? His hobby was electronic music. He is composing music using this eMagic Logic software. Upon his return to Greece, to Crete especially, he realized that the scene of rave was very much underdeveloped there, nearly non-existent. So what he did was he set up this organization, a profit-driven organization, and he went about to organize events like parties, going to clubs and saying, I want to do this party tonight. And so basically charging people a fee for participating in the events that his company organizes. There is nothing wrong with making money. What is wrong with him is that if you ask him, oh, he has an E1 connection to the net. He's inside the university, therefore he has access to a fast connection line. And he downloads music from the net. Every day, minute after minute, he downloads album after album. If you ask him, please, can you copy this CD for me? I love this artist and I would like to listen to his latest album. And you ask him, you know, please make a copy for me. He says, no. No copy for you. Why not? Since you've copied that music from the net, you've downloaded it, you never paid any money. So why you don't give it to me for free? Because he says, if I give you this music for free, you might be tempted to do the same thing I do to make money. 
So where he's located in Crete, no matter how absurd and how weird that might sound, having access to music, having plenty of music, thousands of digitalized albums, is the basis on which his power is built. There are a few people, mostly DJs, coming from the old school with vinyl and you know what I'm talking about. But they are not digitally inclined. They do not use the net. They do not know where from they should go to download music. They just know how to DJ. So all those people come around my friend and tell him, look, if you allow us, if you give us some of that music you've downloaded, we'll do anything for you. We'll become your slaves. <laughs> He's a hacker, don't take me wrong. I'm not equating him with you. All I'm saying is that hackers, because we live in an increasingly digital society, digital economy, an economy in which immaterial products like CDs, like, like everything basically. I mean, Microsoft has 10 times the market capitalization of Ford. Ford has assets that cost 10 times more than the entire Microsoft. So why does Microsoft have a higher market capitalization, which means that if Bill Gates was to go to the stock exchange and say, look, I'm out of Microsoft, please give me my money, he would get more money than, than Ford. Why is that so? Because our economy nowadays is more than ever established on the value of immaterial products. Do you agree with me? Hold on. Yeah, I think you should be very careful when you say immaterial product. A CD is not, I mean a CD is not at all immaterial. Yeah. That's right, that's right. That's right, but it, it, um, it comes out of a production of work. So what, what, what actually is a material in this? This is a material product, huh? Matter, plastic. <laughs> I didn't pay 1,500 euros for the plastic. What I gave the money for is for all this condensed knowledge that makes up what's inside. What's inside it, like Marco said, is immaterial. You need to put it in a CD to take it with you, but still some sort of language code that only makes sense if I regard it as something immaterial. So what I'm saying is that a blank CD costs nothing. A CD in which music, especially by famous artists, is being stored in, costs much more. So the value is not in the material device used to transmit and to carry that value along, but it lies in what's in there, immaterial, behind the surface, behind the plastic. Please. Um, I think that's a myth. Um, <laughs> um, I think um, you or whoever paid uh, 1,500 euros because the company uh, thought um, with 1,500 uh, euros they um, could make out their profit um, because with 2,000 euros uh, um, uh, less people would buy it, and with uh, 1,300 euros, um, they couldn't uh, get a big enough cut of it. I, I don't think the price is the matter here because uh, we're talking about, I mean, uh, this specific 
computer is, is an apple and it's, I don't know if we should, uh, or I, if I should need to say it, but uh, Micro X contains a lot of intellectual property and this is also what you buy. And if I go to China, I live in China sometimes, and if I go there and, and say I want to, uh, I go to some kind of factory and say, or produce me some integrated circuit chips and they tell me, okay, we do it for, say, an amount of money that is N and <clears throat> so, what my problem is, is not that I can, cannot produce those chips, but I don't have the knowledge. I don't know what to do. This is the information. Yeah, um, I think um, um, equating a value um, with uh, price is the myth. Creating value? E equating. E equating. <laughs> I just had some problem understanding his English, so I asked him in German. Um, so he said that um, worth is money. That's the myth. I I, you didn't? No. Why didn't you just say that? I said that's, uh, that is the myth. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's the myth. So, so we can make money out of the myth. If the myth is successful, you can accumulate money because of it. You can make money out of it. Yeah, of course. That's what you're saying? Of course, cannot disagree. <laughs> we see this. All right, more contributions. Thank you. Um, I think that the problem is that we are putting too much value into intellectual property uh, nowadays. Because I mean, 200 years ago, if I went to a blacksmith and bought an axe, um, I didn't just pay the, the 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 price for the for the material. I also paid a little amount of, of, of money for the intellectual property the blacksmith was putting into the, um, the axe. So, and nowadays that shifts even more that the material gets cheaper and cheaper, but we, we, we are paying more for the intellectual property. And that's, that's, I think, the problem we are talking about here. That we are paying for the information. The information is always bound to a, to a carrier, which is the laptop or the CD or whatever. And the carrier gets cheaper and cheaper, but the information gets more expensive. Thank you. Um, I would like to argue that the discussion should not be around immaterial products and intellectual property as such. When we're paying a CD, you can always argue, well, I'm paying a dollar for the actual plastic and something else is intellectual property. What I think where the value creation happens is the value of time and the value of the people who worked on this product that you developed. If you pay Microsoft $100 for a product or $500, you're paying the developers, you know, the hundreds, who worked on this product, you know, who spent their days working on it. Um, Microsoft in and of itself is a company with 55,000 employees. That's not, you know, intellectual property to be disregarded as just a cloud out there. Um, you're actually paying someone's time. If you're, you know, downloading a book for free, you're downloading, you know, an author's worth of a year for free without any compensation. So I think the discussion should not be around what's material, what's immaterial. When you bought the axe before, what was much more expensive was the iron. Now what's more expensive is the time that goes into making a product. Um, you know, Windows or whatever operating system, you know, Debian or something else, takes years to come out you know, to a fully refined version. You're paying for that. You're not paying for anything else. Please, applaud. Please. <laughs> That's where I wanted to go to. The point is not whether a product or something can be digital or not. What is important is the process through which this thing comes into being. What matters is not the result, the final product of the production process, but the production process itself. Right now in this room, and I have the privilege of having met him personally, is a unique thinker. What he says is, that the object of intellectual property is not to create wealth, is not to make money, but intellectual property is first and foremost designed to control people. According to one of his papers, IBM has a patent on how to employ and retain free software developers, which means that if you've ever developed a line of HTML, you would have to get IBM's permission 
before going to work at any other company. Is that insane or not? Yet this patent exists. Has anybody inside this room ever developed a single line of HTML? Raise your hands, please. <laughs> Everybody? So unless you work for IBM, you have to go to IBM and get permission to work elsewhere. This situation has not been demonstrated to its full extent, mostly because it's not necessary for them to do it right now. Yet soon, I believe the time will come when intellectual property will be used, will be deployed for what it actually is, a mechanism to control workers, not a mechanism to make money by selling the material or material products. What is important? I mean, we have people like Lawrence Lessig, and he says, ah, intellectual property should be reformed because there is a big major difference between material and immaterial products. That's bollocks. What's important is the production process, as you said. It takes three or four or five years time to produce something like Microsoft Windows. So say I'm a Windows developer. I've spent five years of my life developing Windows. Can I go to another company and say, look, I've developed Windows and that's the product of my labor and I'd like to take it with me and apply it to a different situation in a different company, in a different production setting. No, because Microsoft, Microsoft or Microsoft would object to my doing so. She would say, listen, you signed this intellectual property agreement, it's included in your contract and you cannot take your knowledge of Windows with you when you go to work elsewhere. Uh, I saw somebody raising his hand. Would you like to add something? Yeah. There is a major flaw in the example of the X because intellectual property is not about paying for the, the knowledge. It's about one person telling all other persons that he is the only one who should be able to build X's. So it means intellectual property is not for giving money for a product. It's about keeping other people out from making products. It's about keeping other people out from starting production processes or creative processes. That's in fact all. I saw another hand somewhere or... Nope. All right then, so... Let's go back to myths. Why is this whole intellectual property, this whole myth, this whole spectacle happening right now? And where does it lead to? Aside from being designed to control workers, to control the production process itself, the material, I uh, forget the last word, intellectual property, exists and will become more powerful, more a powerful mechanism that, than it already is. Because a myth central to capitalism is no longer feasible, has lost its attraction. There was this myth that wealth multiplied in three generations. Say I start today with empty pockets and with empty hands and I don't have any money, so I'm penniless, and I go about living my life. I would first try to build a house, then I would find a job, then I would have a family, perhaps have a son or a daughter, and sooner or later die. My son or my daughter would repeat the process once more. The only major difference is that my son or my daughter would inherit a house, the house I built with my hands. Once this process would be completed, he would, of course, die. But his son or his daughter, which means my grandson or my granddaughter, would inherit more than my son or my daughter did, because the one house 
in the space of one generation would become three houses. Do, do you understand that? No, it, it, it's obvious. In countries like Greece, it was always reckoned that wealth would multiply. So say you are penniless, your son would not be penniless. He would have a house, would have some money, some insurance in life. There was this belief in that capitalism could expand wealth. The reason that of capitalism is that wealth could increase total wealth of society. That's why our societies are organized in a manner as the one we see today. Do we? I don't want to go. All right then, so uh, I hope I was not a pain in the ass since I didn't have the mic in the very beginning of uh, this conversation. I would like to take it further with you, so please, uh, you know, just grab me outside, say, look, you say bullshit, I want to tell you that in person, and that's why I'm thinking you're saying bullshit. I'd like to thank you all for being here. It's a great honor for me to be among this excellent crowd of people. And always remember, the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in times of great moral crisis maintain their neutrality. Thank you a lot.